Hello everybody, my name is Justin. I'm a clinical exercise physiologist working in Colorado and today I made a YouTube video that's going to go over the basics of stress testing for new exercise physiologists. Let's get right on into it. So the information in this video, it's going to all be coming from ACSM's guidelines for exercise testing and prescription, the 11th edition. This is their newest edition in their clinical series. So this video is going to encase five different parts. Part one is going to be why we perform clinical stress tests. Part two is going to be what the testing staff looks like. Part three is going to be contraindications to not performing a stress test. Part four is going to be contraindications to stopping a stress test. And part five is going to be some EKG review at the end. All right, right on. So let's get started. Uh, part one, why do we perform clinical stress tests? So we perform clinical stress tests for the diagnosis, the prognosis, and the evaluation of some sort of cardiac disease, cardiac abnormality. So diagnosis, we'll just break that down just a little bit. Diagnosis is going to be looking for the presence of disease or some sort of abnormal response of the heart. That's the first thing that this test is looking for is to diagnose what's going on. Second part is gonna be prognosis, and that's gonna be the risk of the disease. So how bad is the disease? And then part three is gonna be evaluation of the body's physiologic response to the exercise being performed. All right, so what does the testing staff look like? That's gonna be a little different depending on where you're working. So I personally work at a direct supervision clinic. So that's when I'm performing the stress tests all by myself, but I have a physician within the vicinity from either just down the hall in case anything of emergency would occur. So personal supervision is when the physician is directly present within the stress testing laboratory. Direct supervision, again, that's when the physician is within the vicinity of the stress testing laboratory. And then general supervision is when the physician is available by phone. Um, like I said, every clinic is a little bit different. Some clinics will have a mid-level, such as a PA or nurse practitioner who are overwatching the test, while other clinics are gonna give all that responsibility to the clinical exercise physiologist. There are a variety of different stress tests that you will perform. Um, I'd say the most basic ones you are gonna perform are the standard Bruce protocol stress test. For that test, again, you're just hooking patients up to a 12 lead EKG and you're doing the Bruce protocol looking for abnormal responses to diagnose some sort of cardiac disease. While performing a Bruce protocol stress test, you are going to be trying to reach a target heart rate of at least 85% of the patient's age predicted max heart rate. So it's going to be different for everyone. How it's often determined is 220 minus the patient's age, and then you take 0.85 to get 85% of the patient's age predicted max heart rate. That's going to be the goal of the stress test is to hit at least that 85% target heart rate. So if I were to be performing a stress test on myself, how I would determine my target heart rate, I would take 220 minus my age, I'm 27 years old, so I'd minus 220 minus 27, it would get me 193, and then I would take the 193 and times that by 0.85 to get 85% of my age predicted max heart rate of 193, which would give me a target heart rate of 164 beats per minute. Me reaching that heart rate of 164 would make that a clinical diagnostic test for review. So it is very important to remember that it is the supervising physician's responsibility to interpret the stress test results, whether it's a pers personal supervision, direct supervision, or general supervision. The exercise physiologist does not have the legal responsibility to diagnose the test. We are simply just performing the test and sending the information to the physician to review. All right, now that we got parts one and two out of the way, we're gonna start going into contraindications to performing a clinical stress test. All right, so at this point, before you start working with the patient, you're gonna wanna just make sure you're going over their health history. So things that I look at are the medications they're taking. I look to see if they're on any beta blockers or any blood pressure medications, just to have some knowledge on how their body might react to the exercise. I look to see if they've had any past clinical stress tests to see how their performance was in their past tests. And then I also look for, you know, any cardiac history that they may have that may contraindicate doing the stress test. All right, so next up, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to put the absolute and relative contraindications up here on the screen um, for your review. 
I'm assuming that if you're watching this video, um, you know what absolute and relative contraindications are for performing stress tests. So after you've gone over the patient's health history and all the relative information that you need to perform your stress test, you will bring the patient back to your stress testing laboratory. Um, a lot of the times you're going to have them sign a consent form before they even proceed. That should be the very first thing that you do from the start. And then what I do is I give them the whole rundown um, so they know exactly what they're getting into. Obviously, you're going to want to be calm, collected, composed. You're not going to want to feel really anxious like, oh my God, we're doing a stress test. Calm, relaxed, composed, best way to do it every single time. So I always let the patient know kind of what the speed and the incline are for the stages. So I let them know that for the very first stage, it's going to start off with a 10% incline. It's going to be 1.7 miles per hour. Then every three minutes gradually gets a little bit faster and steeper. So, you know, stage two, it's going to be two and a half miles per hour, 12% incline. Stage three, 3.4 miles per hour. 14% incline, stage four, 4.2 miles per hour, 16% incline, and so on. Throughout the test, you're obviously gonna be wanting to observe to see if the patient's having any symptoms. So, you know, any onset of chest pain, um, if they're having any breathing difficulties, you know, kind of gauging their fatigue. I do like to talk to them a lot throughout the test. So, how are you doing? You know, how does this feel for you? Do you feel like you can go faster or steeper than this? Oh yes, maybe, yes or no. And what you do is you take the information that you have in front of you, you know, your heart rate, their blood pressure, their SpO2, all of that good stuff. Um, and then you can use that to kind of gauge how to progress throughout the stress test. So as you're performing your stress test, the biggest things you're gonna to wanna to be keeping your eyes out for are relative and absolute contraindications to stopping a stress test. Um, these are very important to know and you're absolutely going to need to know these if you're going to be performing any type of stress test on a patient. Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just throw these up right here on the screen for your review. Um, again, these are absolute and relative contraindications to being or terminating a stress test, putting those up on the screen right now. All right, right on. So lastly, I'm just going to go over a couple EKGs with you that you might encounter. Um, as you're performing stress tests, a lot of the times, you know, biggest things we're really looking for are those ST segment changes. So we'll go over those here in just a minute. So if you're an exercise physiologist in the stress testing realm, I'm going to assume you already know how to read EKGs, but we're going to go over this real quick. So remember, one big box horizontally is going to equal 0.2 seconds. So if we put five big boxes together, that's going to equal one second one big box vertically that's going to equal five millimeters so one small box within that big box is going to be one millimeter zooming in a little closer remember we're going to be watching the small boxes during our stress test one millimeter of st segment elevation is an absolute indication to stop test well two millimeters of st segment depression is a relative indication to stop a test this information is incredibly important as an exercise physiologist doing stress testing. So this is a breakdown of the coronary anatomy of the 12 lead EKG. Obviously we got our anterior septal leads, our inferior leads, our lateral leads, and then we have our ABR lead. These are very important to know if there's a suspected compromised vessel during our stress test such as if we're looking at the right coronary artery, we're gonna be watching very closely on leads two, three, AVF. If we're looking at the LAD, we're gonna be watching leads V1 through V4 very closely. But it is very important to watch the entire EKG throughout the stress test. If there are any ST segment changes in any leads, it is a very good idea to now shift to the entire EKG to make sure there is not more than one vessel that has been compromised. So this is a good example of a very abnormal EKG. We're gonna go into this one a little bit closer. So looking at this EKG, I've got the isoelectric line highlighted, which is where we're gonna look for our millimeters of ST segment depression and elevation. Obviously, this EKG is very abnormal and has three millimeters of downsloping ST segment depression 60 to 80 milliseconds after the J point. Shifting over to our AVR lead, we can clearly see that we have one millimeter of ST elevation 60 to 80 milliseconds after the J point. This is why it's extremely important to watch the entire EKG throughout the test. 
Here is a snapshot of some paraoximidal supraventricular tachycardia. If we zoom in a little closer, we can also see our ST segment changes. This is another indication to stop a test. But lastly, we got ventricular tachycardia. This is a blatantly obvious arrhythmia to stop a test. Um, not to mention, you may even need to perform some ACLS procedures if the patient is symptomatic and unable to break out of this rhythm. So that's gonna pretty much do it for this video. Again, this video is for new exercise physiologists who are just getting started in the stress testing realm. I do plan on making a more advanced video in the future that's gonna break down um, some of the concepts and information that we went through in this video a little deeper. But if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and hit that like button, subscribe, leave a comment, let me know what you thought and uh, look forward to doing this again. I hope this video helped out. Justin out. Peace.